Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar on pain management, the superstars of Ayurveda. My name is Dr. Juliette Sweet, and I'm a an naturopathic physician and an Ayurvedic practitioner. And I received um, both my doctorate degree in naturopathic medicine, as well as a master's degree in Ayurvedic medicine um, from Bastyr University in Washington. And I'm really excited today to discuss um, various naturopathic and Ayurvedic approaches to pain. Um, and this webinar and continuing edu education credit that you'll be receiving are um, both sponsored by Rebel Herbs, so thank you. And I just wanna uh, make sure that you all can hear me and that everything is working well. So if you could just type in what kind of practitioner you are in the chat box so I can um, get an idea of who's here and just make sure that you guys can hear me and that everything's working well. So we have a naturopathic doctor here with us today, um, an individual who's doing a lot of uh, education with cannabis, um, acupuncture, doctor of oriental medicine, Ayurvedic practitioner. Great, so I just wanna make sure you can uh, hear me and it sounds like you can since you're answering in the, in the chat box. Um, so we will go ahead and I'm gonna do my best <laughs> to stick to this uh, schedule. We'll spend about 10 minutes just reviewing um, the philosophies of Ayurvedic and naturopathic medicine, um, perception of pain, types of pain, the different aspects that we're all looking for, of course, as practitioners. And then we'll talk about specific herbs, um, maybe some of them you're already using, but I wanna offer some, some new insight on those. And then of course, some research on the different herbs and some Ayurvedic treatments. And um, we'll go into some case studies towards the end. And then I, I hope to leave some time to discuss any cases you might have or have questions about the, the presentation itself. Um, in regard to the continuing education credit, the if you're here as an Ayurvedic practitioner, um, you will be receiving a certificate from Rebel Herbs. And then for naturopathic doctors, um, whether you're in Oregon or anywhere in the, in the country, we will be emailing those to you um, through AANP or Syncopate. So, um, and I had a question, is your PowerPoint available? Yes, I can absolutely share my PowerPoint with you all and even a uh, recording of this power or this um, presentation as well. So we already talked about what type of practitioners are here. Um, so we'll jump right in. We have pain, the multifactorial aspects of pain. So of course we uh, know that there is physical pain um, and acute injury or surgery, anything that's happening um, to the tissues of the body, and then chronic pain that persists after tissue healing has occurred, whether that's an injury or surgery. Of course, anything chronic is over three months, um, but you know there's some leeway with deep surgeries and different things. We would expect pain to be there a little bit longer. Um, emotional, of course, pain provokes an emotional response. Um, I see this pretty much with all my patients, so I, I would say if you know, in most, but if not all people. And then the mental perception of pain, it really varies from person to person. Chronic pain, I'm always really fascinated how some patients are really able to work through living with chronic pain and others can become defeated. And so pain pathways, of course, become more ingrained as they're going on and on. And certain, you know, people will identify with their pain and, and their life kind of revolves around it. Um, and so, I wanna talk a bit about Ayurvedic philosophy because it is woven into uh, the way we look at individuals and the, the basis of it is sort of, we are the microcosm of the macrocosm. And so the elements that are in nature are also inside of us. And so we look at the different, we call them doshas and it's a combination of elements and their qualities that make up the different types. And we all have every dosha and every element inside of us. But vata is air and ether, pitta is fire and water, and kapha is earth and water. So 
any sort of imbalance of these uh, elements and doshas will be the basis or some property of disease, so the disease process. And then the specific qualities are really important for treatment. And maybe you've heard the term prakriti or vikriti. So prakriti is sort of your constitution, what you came in at, um, into the world with, and what we're trying to get you back to, to be more in balance. And then vikriti is your current constitution, um, meaning your current state of imbalance, really, is what that translates to. And then the concepts about these elements being inside of our body and all of us having every one of them, um, we can see air um, in the body. It's important for anything to do with movement. Um, and water is our blood, our lymph, and ether is really sort of the body cavities or anything to do with space in the body. Earth is substance, it's dense, it's heavy. So it's our skin, our bones, our tissue. And then fire is really important. It's our metabolism, our digestion, and all of that. So pain is known as shula, or an imbalance of the doshas, as I mentioned. Vata, the um, air and ether quality, is really always involved. So it's the ruler of the nervous system. And it's a disturbance of prana or life force. And prana and vata are very much um, working together, um, moving things in the body, um, our breath and our life force. So pitta is going to be important when there's inflammation. And the qualities of, of pitta, heat, when there's heat in the body, if it's sharp pain, penetrating or pulsating pain. Um, and then kapha, one of my mentors used to say, where there's stagnation, there is pain. And that is absolutely true. If there's any sort of swelling of the fluid, congestion, pressure, even a tumor, but the qualities are really this sort of dull, achy pain that's present. And then we have to consider other things. And this will, weaves very well with naturopathic medicine. Um, we look at the vitality of the person and we call that ojas and that's sort of the um, immune system and vitality, their, their vis, and then our agni, which is our digestive fire. And that's imperative to health and metabolism and really balancing everything in the body. And then we also consider ama, which is a toxic buildup in the body. So these are our naturopathic principles and someone let me know if you are up to date on if we added Another one, um, I heard that there was science being added, but maybe that was more in the therapeutic order. Um, anyways, do no harm, of course, treat the whole person, identifying the root cause, um, the healing power of nature, our physician as teacher, and then we do a lot with prevention. And so I'll kind of go more into what that looks like comparing the two. So they both want to look at the whole person and treat the individual. We assess the vitality, the visa of the person. Physician as teacher, we help our patients feel empowered, have tools to deal with pain, cope with it, be able to monitor. Um, in Ayurvedic medicine, we call it dinacharya, which is a daily routine that we can offer patients to sort of help keep them more in balance. And then um, the healing power of nature. So not just using natural substances as in herbs that we'll be talking about today, but really stimulating the nature of the individual, their nature to heal. So their prakriti. Um, and let's talk about, of course, treating the root cause. Um, and so some of this is just what I mentioned, but really treating the gut. So the gut is the home of the doshas. And in you know naturopathic medicine we always look at treating the gut and so as hippocrates says all disease begins in the gut so that is sort of the basis of what we're looking at now tried and true turmeric of course we're thinking about turmeric for different types of pain um i wanted to just offer a little bit of a fun slide here turmeric because it's been used for so many thousands of years in Ayurvedic medicine. Um, it's in all of the ancient texts and it has a lot of different names. And so um, you can see the different names here depending on all of the different languages. And Haldi or yellow, this is a bride um, to the right and she is 
being covered in a turmeric paste and actually the groom will have this done to him too and so this is um, in Hindi it's a haldi ceremony and the bride and groom will be covered in this paste it's a cleansing procedure and it's really auspicious in Indian tradition and it represents a life of prosperity for the couple um, about to begin their new life together and then if you're a participant and you're single if you get blessed with this paste you will find a good looking match so um, I can't imagine being covered in that paste but she looks really happy so um, these are the uh, constituents and sort of the actions of turmeric and we know that in clinical use it can be used for anything to do with inflammation, uh, also helpful with uh, reducing blood sugar and helpful for cardiac uh, function. So just contraindicated, of course, if you're on any anticoagulants um, and then watch for hypoglycemia, it also might help uh, statins work better. So um, just some things to think about. This was a a study that I found on curcumin with um, patients in active rheumatoid arthritis. And so it was actually comparing curcumin alone, um, diclofenac sodium, which is an NSAID alone, or a combination of both. And it was all 500 milligrams um, twice a day. And the other thing that was um, a factor was the patient's participants could not be on any other NSAID any DMARD therapy or anti-TNF um, therapy for their rheumatoid arthritis. And, you know, they were looking at different disease activity scores, American College Rheumatology criteria for swelling and tenderness. Um, all three groups showed significant reduction um, in the DAS score. But the curcumin group actually showed the greatest improvement in both scores, and it was significantly more than the diclofenac sodium group um, that was just taking that. And so really the, the cool thing about this article that they highlighted was the importance of it, its safety and adverse events. And so, you know, for thinking about the adverse effects of or side effects of an NSAID, um, you know, GI bleeding and different things, this would be a great option um, for patients in an active flare. And then here are the <clears throat> energetic properties of turmeric. Why I bring this up is, um, of course, the science behind each herb is really important. But if we can understand the energetic properties as well, it gives us another layer of maybe understanding why in some patients certain herbs work really well. And then in other patients, there is a bit of a you know, maybe this, it's not working as much or it's not affecting them the way that we would expect. And so I like to always think about what are the energetics of the herb and the properties of them. Turmeric is actually tridoshic, so it's balancing for all constitutions. So you don't have to worry too much about how it's affecting the vata, pitta, kapha in a person. Um, the taste is bitter, uh, the qualities light, dry, it is sort of a heating herb if we're putting that on this on the spectrum of, of hot or cold and then the post digestive effect is sort of pungent so um there's a lot of recipes and kind of a you know all the hype about golden milk right now and there's you know it's a fun thing to try and it's great for bedtime as an anti-inflammatory any for antioxidants and a digestive aid and then this is a interesting concept so Everybody is talking about curcumin and products are coming out with 95% curcuminoids and all of that. But in general, I don't know how many of you are, are aware that curcumin is really hard to, it's, it's hard for the body to actually absorb and utilize. So the bioavailability is really not great. Um, so usually what ends up happening is um, People are adding an oil or um, having really high potency so that you can actually get a therapeutic amount. And high potencies can end up being really expensive. In India, in general, they would take um, turmeric and then add some sort of lipid, so milk or, you know, just as the golden milk, as I mentioned, but uh, ghee maybe. And so um, what this study was looking at was really the presence of tumorones, which are the lipophilic compound in turmeric, and how that affects the bioavailability of curcumin. And so they found that it really 
helped not only um, transporting curcumin across membranes, but it increased the intracellular curcumin that they found. And this was in human um, um, GI cells, and actually this is a, was on cancer, um, so adenocarcinoma. And so then the length of the time that the curcumin was present in the cells was also looked at, and it was improved with the presence of tumorones. So having that same plant constituent, same DNA, um, can be really helpful. And since we have somebody here um, that does cannabis education, you know, I might be um, leaping here, but I, I honestly think that the more research we do on curcumin or turmeric about curcumin and tumorones and all of the other constituents that are in this amazing plant, that we're going to start to realize the importance of the full spectrum. And so with cannabis, of course, there's more and more research coming out about how the THC and CBD potentiate each other and, you know, the importance really of this, this wisdom that plants have, all of these constituents, and that it helps us not only use them, but metabolize them, and basically the constituents are helping each other be more potent in the body. And so I think we're going to hear more and more about tumorones. Um, Curcumin alone are full spectrum. So this is a chart that kind of shows what happens with the absorption. And as you can see, curcumin um, in the presence of tumorones will actually have a 200% faster absorption and a 300% better bioavailability. And then you can see the retention is longer as well. So 10 times longer retention of, of the medicine. And so, I think the bioavailability potentiation of the different constituents and um, more and more, how can we create some really potent medicine um, using a full spectrum? So um, this is the next herb I wanna talk about and you probably have heard of it, maybe you're using it already, um, Boswellia serrata or Indian frankincense. The properties anti-inflammatory, it's really great just as an analgesic, so helping to just stop pain um, and the perception of it. And we look at the volatile oils, um, terpenoids, and then boswellic acids. So it can be used in inflammatory bowel disease, osteoarthritis. Um, it's helpful for immunomodulation. They're doing some research on, well, there's some already, but more research is coming out in the oncology field. Um, and it can also be helpful for the brain. So it's well tolerated for the most part. There can be some GI upset. Um, the Boswellia resin is not recommended in lactation or pregnancy, although um, I, I did find a resource that um, women are, and human are, are chewing this during, during pregnancy and for different pains and, and effect on the body. I could see why they would be doing that. Um, so Boswellia, both in RA and OA, feel bad for that little ant, but I look, <laughs> I like to think about the doctrine of signatures here. So in the osteoarthritis study, um, they were noticing that it was actually helping the cartilage of the joints. And so the substance, right, is sort of stick and sticky and really dense and kind of heavy. And so I, I like to think about how that might translate in the body um, to help with cartilage. And so with that study, the osteoarthritis, it was a small study, um, but it was basically Boswellia extract or a placebo. And they were doing, um, what I liked was they did some x-rays and they showed actually decrease in the osteophytes and improved knee joint gap. They were also looking at HSCRP, which um, I found a different study, but it was talking a lot more about how the HSCRP, I always thought of it more for cardiac, but they were looking at the progression of osteoarthritis compared to CRP. So that's why they were doing that piece. And then, um, of course, patients were having, or participants were having reduction in their pain and stiffness and all of that. Um, and then RA as well. Um, basically, they were looking at ESR stiffness and then 
looking for tolerance and side effects for that one. And so I do have all the resources at the end of the PowerPoint and most of them are full text. I tried to find full text um, that would be available without having a um, you know, subscription. So um, how many of you are currently using turmeric and or boswellia in your practice? And yesterday or Monday I did a poll um, but I just want you to answer it in the text um, box. So let me know if you are already using these herbs with your patients who have pain. And I, I did the poll on Monday and it, the rest of the PowerPoint got stuck on it. For, so I don't want that to happen again. Um, you can just say yes or no. Are you guys using Boswellia and turmeric with your patients and Yes, you do. Yes, absolutely. Um, great. So there's a student on here. Welcome. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, awesome. So you're already using those. Perfect. Um, I want to talk about Tinospora cordifolia. So I don't know if you've heard of this herb, but it's often talked about in cardiac. Um, and we'll have a webinar next month on because it's February and it's Heart Health Month, and we'll talk about um, Gaduchi in our heart health webinar as well. So Tinospora cordifolia, also known as Caducci or heart-leaved moonseed, I love that name. Um, the leaves, of course, look like these beautiful hearts. And so doctrine of signatures for our, our heart health. Um, but what I was researching and finding more information on, and we'll kind of go into what I found, um, was this can be really helpful for acute pain. So anti-inflammatory um, and an immunomodulator, it's really, it has a lot of antioxidants in it. The great thing about Gaducci is it's really safe. I could not find any information on adverse effects, side effects, drug-drug interaction. Um, and of course, we don't recommend it in pregnancy just due to uh, limited research. So I found quite a bit of research. Now, the research um, on acute inflammation always tends to be on animals and the, I didn't want to, Put the, put the titles of the studies up here, but you'll find them in the resources. Um, basically, what they were doing was was trying to see how Gaducci would have would affect uh, acute pain and swelling, and what receptors in the body were being uh, affected. And so, they found out that there was um, through burning, which would basically create inflammation, pain, and swelling. Um, what activity would Gaducci have on the receptors, the opioid receptors, and then so central pain as well as peripheral pain. And so that was via the prostaglandin synthesis for the peripheral. And so you can see the different mechanisms that were being affected. Um, the catecholomethyltransferase, uh, the COMT, I don't know, there's more and more research coming out about any sort of uh, mutations in this gene and how that might be one of the key indicating um, indicators for how we perceive pain differently than other people. And if there is a mutation in that, some people who don't feel pain at all, um, that gene is, is very much linked into how we are processing and perceiving pain. Um, and then the good thing about the Gaducci compared to NSAIDs was that it was really protective against the gastric mucosa compared to um, the insides being used. And so um, the energetic properties of Gaducci are that it is bitter and astringent, very light. I like this picture. It's almost like the, I don't know, it's like dancing or something, but um, it's heating, but not aggravating to pitta. And then it is sweet. So very nourishing to the body. And so once again, triadoshic and balancing for all different constitutions. So you don't have to worry too much about um, pushing any sort of energetics in the body. Of course, you all know ginger. Um, ginger has so many great uses. And these are the constituents we look at a lot in different studies. Uh, it's anti-inflammatory. We use it a lot for nausea, anti-arthritic, antiviral. So really helpful. It's a driver. Of course, we use it in formulas to kind of help 
move other medicines into the body, um, kind of increasing circulation and that sort of thing, contraindicated with blood thinners and aspirin. Um, why I bring up ginger though is I when I would when I would think about using ginger in my patients and in my practice, I would think a lot about GI, of course. Um, and but what I've found is with certain patients that I'm already doing turmeric, I'm already doing Boswellia, we're doing different modalities, we'll get into later. Um, but the ginger, especially if they are a cold constitution or if you live in a cold climate. So I'm in New Mexico, it's cold and dry, and I think can be helpful when there's that extra piece of maybe why patients are not getting relief is to add some ginger on there. I know in in, um, in traditional Chinese medicine, they use it a lot as well. So anyways, I found a couple studies on ginger for musculoskeletal and rheumatism, and they were looking at, you know, how ginger could ameliorate ameliorate the um, symptoms that they were having and then kind of what was happening. So prostaglandin and leukotriene synthesis. Um, so it's inhibiting those. And then when we're looking at, you know, more and more, I know there's a lot of text on here, but inhibiting cyclooxygenase 2, 5-lipoxygenase. I need to slow myself down today. Um, and then as far as immunomodulation, the T helper cells, um, anti-inflammatory cytokines, superoxide dismutase, so helping with um, kind of detoxifying and inflammation. And so once again, um, those studies are, are available for you. But I want to talk about this next one because I was excited to think about utilizing this and it's just a simple thing we can do. Um, but basically it was ginger for pelvic pain. And so if you think about the stag sometimes the stagnation that can happen in the pelvic region um, right before in the beginning of menstruation, ginger was found to be really helpful. So four, there were seven studies and then four of the um, random controlled trials compared the therapeutic efficacy of ginger with placebo. And basically it helped with the pain and they used the visual analog scale and the dosage was anywhere between 750 to 2000 milligrams of ginger powder. And that was just the first three to four days. And that was really, really helpful for women. And so I think that I am going to um, start remembering that really simple piece of how we can help when there is sort of acute pain due to stagnation. And it makes sense, as I mentioned earlier, with any sort of um, kind of stagnation, kapha, and and really the blood is, is very much pitta. And so it kind of helps to just move and um, move any sort of stagnation in the body. Um, so ashwagandha, this herb is often used for adrenal support, for libido, for lots of different things for sort of helping us deal with stress. And of course, it has a very pungent smell. It Ashva is horse and ganda is smell, and it gives you horse-like stamina. So yes, we might be using it for those pieces, but um, it actually can really be helpful in as an anti-inflammatory and anti-arthritic. Um, and there's lots of different studies that are that have been done to show the adaptogenic effects of ashwagandha. But I found one that was specific for knee joint pain. And so these are your patients where they might be really their nervous system is involved in a big way. Of course, the nervous system is always involved in pain, but if they are really kind of stressed out and having the that looping going on of, of pain and, and how it's affecting their life and is ever going to go away and all of that, um, or if they're in chronic pain, then this one can also be very helpful for that because it just really addresses the nervous system. And so um, this study in particular was was not only looking at 
the potency of ashwagandha. So they had two different uh, groups, one that was doing 250 milligrams, one that was doing 125 milligrams, and then a placebo group, all given twice daily. Um, they were using a modified Womac uh, assessment and then knee swelling index, and then also the visual analog scale. And tolerability was assessed by any adverse effects. And so at 12 weeks compared to baseline and placebo, there were significant reductions observed in the um, modified Womac and the knee swelling index. Uh, what they did find though was dosage was important. So the 250 milligram group was showed the earliest efficacy. So at four weeks, they were having decrease in their pain. And then um, also they had the greatest reduction. So dosage obviously being important for getting the therapeutic response um, that you need. And then there, were, there was no GI disturbances or any adverse events. Of, of, of events. And so in Ayurvedic medicine, ashwagandha, just like we call it an, an adaptogen in naturopathic or herbal medicine. Um, it's known as a rasayana, and so it's really a rejuvenative tonic. It helps to build ojas or the immune system and the vitality. And once again, it's going to be warming and calming for the nervous system, so helpful for those patients that have um, stress. And okay, Gokshura. So this Plant. You might have heard of it for a urinary um, system, for libido, lots of other um, uses for this herb, but it can be very helpful um, in pain. And I always find it interesting because, I mean, it looks so ferocious. Um, the the Gokshura, it's known as devil's thorn, or goat's head weed. It's very Pokey and it's in New Mexico. And let me tell you, it definitely attacks you when you're walking through fields and it's hard to get out of your clothes. So, but it, the properties are really that it's cool and sweet and demulcent. So really nourishing for the body. And it is contraindicated with lithium. I found that out. So caution with that. Um, and then due to its effect on the hormones, um, not to be used if there is prostate or breast cancer. Um, it can be a galactagogue, so it is used in lactation. And what I found, um, once again, uh, with the research, they looked at diabetic neuropathy, and it showed that it really helped with neuropathic pain. And I, reading more and more about the herb, it is really helpful as a hypoglycemic. So I think the mechanism there was that it was actually helping to control the diabetes or treat the root cause, which then helped with the neuropathic pain. Um, acute inflammation and edema in mice, it was found to be very helpful. And then it has an analgesic effect. It's not due to the opioid receptors or central acting. Um, and they compared it to endomethacin and then also morphine. Of course, it was less effective than morphine, um, but it was more effective than the inside that they were uh, looking at the endomethacin. Um, as far as the genital urinary system, it's very healing. It decreases renal calculi. It's soothing and, and of course, very helpful. There was a study on um, menopausal women that had unexplained pelvic pain, and it actually really helped to decrease the pain and then also the, the pain that they were having um, in, with sex. And so um, just really kind of out of the box ways of thinking of these herbs and multiple uses. So if you have a patient who you're already needing to help with hormones and maybe they have some pain and maybe there's some stagnation in the pelvic region, you know, think about Gokshura, think about um, tribulus terrestris in, in those patients. And then it also protects joint cartilage. So that mucilaginous sort of demulcent property, once again, we're thinking about the cartilage Okay, um, fun ways of incorporating Ayurvedic herbs into your patient's treatment plans. So, of course, we can do capsules, but what else can we do that's, you know, to decrease the amount of capsules people are taking? Um, if you can get really potent extracts, you can use them in beverages um, or after cooking food, you can add them to sort of create uh, medicinal food. 
And then in Ayurvedic medicine, we talk a lot about um, the delivery system or substance, and we truly believe that taste is important. So as soon as your body, your tongue, your, those nerves get a taste, whether it's sweet, salty, pungent, um, there is going to be biological effects happening in the body. And so it's taste is really important. And then we talk about an anupan, um, which is the delivery system. So I put the anupans that I most think about for patients on the right side here. Aloe, you know, is cooling and demulcent and healing. And so anyone that has inflammation in their body that is hot um, and maybe they have more of a, a pitta constitution, we often think about using aloe gel as an onopon. So you can just take the aloe gel and you can take your powdered formula and you can mix the herbs into it. And that's a way to get it into the body and have sort of a, an additive effect of having that cooling property of the aloe. And then nut milk. Um, so for vata, anybody that has a cold constitution or maybe just needs a little bit of like increasing their vitality and building them up a little bit, right? We think about any sort of warm, nourishing beverage. And of course you can do hot water, but any sort of, if they can stand, you know, if they can handle milk, um, warm milk can be really great to add the herbs into um, or warm nut milk, that sort of thing. In general, coconut is cooling. So if your patients are cold and it's winter time, have them avoid um, using coconut milk as the warming um, anupan. And then for kapha, we actually use, oftentimes you use honey and you'd think, well, honey is really sweet and it wouldn't it increase. Um, raw unfiltered honey, and especially if you can get local, but raw unfiltered honey can actually help stabilize blood sugar. It is um, sort of scraping and detoxifying in the body. And so it can actually be really helpful for that sort of stagnation of, of kapha. And of course, honey makes everything taste good. So if you're putting your, your herbs that maybe don't taste so good in honey, then um, people are probably more likely to do it. Um, of course, some are available in IV or injections. Um, you can do it right into the affected tissue. In Ayurvedic medicine, we have another way of in sort of ingesting herbs, and it's called dumpan, and that is sort of through inhalation of herbs, and you're bypassing the GI for fast relief. So, um, of course, topically, there's some in-office treatments I'll talk about, some warm oil wraps, and daily massage as well. So these are some Ayurvedic treatments for pain. Maybe you've heard of them. Um, Ayurveda loves oil. Uh, my joke is always that um, Ayurveda, oil in every orifice, um, because it really is what they are doing to treat. And because vata is always involved when there's pain, it's the opposite of anything that is unregulated in meaning that the oil is grounding, the oil is stable, the oil is nourishing. Of course, our nervous system loves fat and it is, you know, basically we're insulating the nervous system. And so shiradhara, which is um, warm oil on in a constant stream on the third eye is said to nourish the entire nervous system. Great for insomnia, great for headaches, great for people who are just really stressed out. Um, and the kati basti or just basti in general is sort of creating this dough um, vessel on the body or a dam, a dough dam. And then they use very potent herbally infused oils wherever there is pain and keep adding warm oil. Um, and so it can be really helpful to treat sort of the underlying cause. And then, you know, you can improvise and teach patients how to apply oil treatments at home. Think about castor oil packs and how we use those, um, same concept. And of course, um, having an Ayurvedic practitioner to be able to do these treatments is, is great. So every ancient medicine has one of these. Um, I call it grandmother's secret or, or they do, um, but Maharayan oil, this is just an example of, of a, all the different herbs that are in this oil, but usually there's various um, 
you know, versions of this, but it's 20 to 35 different herbs. It's always sort of this warming, nourishing, lubricating um, oil. And it's used for tendons, ligaments, joints, and it is energetically balanced, but it really treats vata. Once again, that's important for pain calms pitta so calms inflammation and moves kapha so if there's stagnation it's going to help move that and using it daily is great um, best if warm and you know i think in traditional chinese medicine they have the posum oil and so kind of a similar concept it's this it's this really um beautifully balanced ancient oil and it's this red color and i just love that so other ways of addressing pain, um, we have, of course, diet and lifestyle. We're all going to be working on that with our patients. And then herbs, as mentioned in the presentation. Um, cannabis also um, listed in the ancient Ayurvedic texts for pain treatment and very, very potent and helpful. And various methods to address the physical body. So just the, the treatments I mentioned previously, the um, Shiradhara and Basti, and then naturopathic physical medicine, any sort of, you know, hands-on body work to help calm the nervous system or treat the pain directly. Acupuncture, so potent, so powerful, just amazing. Um, there's also neuroacupuncture, which is really changing the neurotransmitters and inhibiting pain signals and reprogramming reprogram that um, path, that, that loop, that feedback loop. Um, detoxification and treating the root cause. So Panchakarma is um, a detoxifying uh, approach in Ayurvedic medicine. Injections, of course, we are, you know, learning more and more about um, biologic oligraft or some people say stem cells. But anyways, those proteins and those um, signaling factors that can help our bodies rebuild. And of course, biofeedback and somatic medicine um, to help people deal with all of the levels of pain. So this actually came out this um, January, January 2020, and they're talking about a lot of different, um, you know, discoveries and pain and, and how they can help with the opioid epidemic and what are they, what are we going to do and how are we going to create new medicine? And um, it was really great, though, because I saw this article in there on UW and how they're actually using distraction techniques. So with a virtual reality, um, having patients utilize a virtual reality while they're in surgery can decrease pain and the need for general anesthesia. And they're doing studies to compare with and without virtual reality um, and just really kind of by distracting the brain, it creates less pain. Um, then, of course, the genetic piece, as I talked about, and you should pick up a copy if you want to, and there's some other good things in there, too. So I want to talk a bit about case studies, and just so I can leave a little bit of time so we can discuss some things if anybody has questions. Um, this was a case where I had a, a woman come to me. She had had all of her um, joints replaced pretty much. So her two hips and both her knees. And in the past, all of the surgeries went fair, you know, fairly well, no issues. Um, but she came to me because the last knee surgery she had, which was three years prior to her coming to see me, was um, there was still swelling. There was pain daily. And the surgeon claimed, you know, that he might have harmed a cutaneous nerve, but there was no major complications. I asked about the hardware. Was there anything different in this hardware compared to the other ones? Maybe her body was having a, you know, a reaction to it. Um, she was in a lot of pain. She was unable to exercise. Um, so she had also gained weight, which was making it harder on her joints. Um, she was on some uh, thyroid support, bone support, just a D3, calcium, that sort of thing. Um, her diet was pretty much standard American. She was snacking a lot on peanuts and peanut butter. Um, she had tried a lot of Western treatments already. So they had done steroid injections. Um, they had put her on hydrocodone for a while, but she, you know, she didn't like the way she would felt. She's working still and she, she didn't like being sort of out of it, she said. And, and also um, she had tried marijuana, which helped, but she was actually unable to um, use the full spectrum um, due to her job. So uh, she was using CBD still, I think maybe that was topically. Um, anyways, we, we started her on 
a regimen of the Ayurvedic uh, herbs we've talked about in this webinar. And I also put her on an anti-inflammatory or anti um kapha and pitta diet. So mainly that means no sugar, alcohol, processed foods, gluten, dairy, corn, um, just anything that would create any extra inflammation in the body. And then I had her substitute almond butter um, instead of having the peanut butter, just to kind of see if there might be some inflammatory stuff happening with that. Hydrotherapy, you know, it's such a great treatment. A lot of patients have a hard time, you know, switching back and forth between hot and cold. And, and if it's the knee, how do you, you know, how do you make that happen? So I just told her at the end of your hot shower, use cold and start from your foot and work your way up towards your knee and just kind of helping to move that lymph. And then I wanted her to incorporate gentle swimming, just get moving, but no impact. So just have some swimming a couple times a week and then we use the maharayan oil topically at nighttime she warmed it up she put it on her knee and then she would wrap it with um you know just gently with a cloth that she didn't care about because just like castor oil it will stain it's red and um then we had a follow-up basically after the first week she noticed decreased swelling um, and she was able to walk more with ease. So the pain was down to a four out of 10. She, she really thought well, it's because I started these herbs, these herbs are really helping me. Um, and then I had her continue everything just as is, um, the three, three month follow-up we had, and she only lives in New Mexico part of the year. So, um, we kind of, you know, followed up um, via phone and, and I didn't get a chance to see it at the three month follow up um, her knee, but pain was down to a one to two out of 10, mostly just dull and achy, but not constant. So she was able to decrease the formula to half a dose and the improvement sustained. My goal is always, if I can, you know, to help patients and not have them stay on anything forever. Um, just get the body back to balance. She had lost 25 pounds at the three month follow up. Um, the six month follow up, she had pain um, only if she was sitting too long. And it wasn't that that high of pain. It was one out of 10. Um, she's going to continue her diet and lifestyle. The, the holidays happened. So she had a little bit of a plateau, but she still was, you know, lost 15 more pounds. And she's walking and still swimming. She's using the topical oil just as needed. And she's continuing the formula. And, she said she'll, you know, once she gets back on her regimen, she'll do a trial of eliminating and, and seeing how she feels. So this study um, is a patient I've had for a few years and he is in chronic pain and he has a congenital confusion of C1, C2. So basically it, they're, they're working as one unit. Um, but due to that, or, you know, I'm not exactly sure what prompted all of it, pain most most likely was um, he's had two neck surgeries and they went in the front and they also went in the back to um, work on his neck and so he's got a lot of scar tissue and he gets these what he calls zingers down the right arm especially with increased pressure or twisting opening up a jar will really cause that there is a history of opioid addiction um, times, times 10 years and Kratom. So I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with Kratom, but it is an opioid. Uh, it's a natural substance, um, but it is uh, it does affect the opioid pathways. And um, so just watch out for that. Uh, he uses medical cannabis regularly. He has chiropractic um, meditation, but it's a constant battle of the mind. He says it's very exhausting, of course, to be in chronic pain. Um, diet is is pretty good. And then um, only other prescriptions he's on are lisinopril, and then he does some bone support as well. So ongoing treatment. Um, we have him on a high potency boswellia and curcumin. It's not taking away the pain, but it keeps the pain levels at bay, at least one to two points below his normal threshold of pain. And so he'll do trials, he'll stop taking it, and then he'll notice that his pain level's gone up. And so there is some therapeutic effect of just kind of keeping the pain level down to a more manageable, um, you know, baseline. And then we do myofascial treatments always with oil, trigger point, um, working with the, the nervous system directly, and 
he uses topical CBD um, to maintain levels in the body and then a potent one with THC when there's breakthrough pain. Uh, chiropractic and strengthening of muscles to counteract atrophy. There's, he's actually had a lot of atrophy um, because you know when you're in that much pain, you're really scared to move and to aggravate. And so, you know, he told me I could use this quote, but he said I can either keep living my life to the best of my ability with chronic pain and try to relish the moments of joy or give up. And he said some days are easier than others. He is definitely on a uh, spiritual understanding of his pain. And I think this, this gives him purpose. And he says that it's really a practice of being present and meaning and purpose in life with pain. And so my job is to really encourage his journey, whatever that means. Um, I did want to bring up a, something that happened recently with him, though. Um, he had a acute cholecystitis and actually ended up having surgery. And I was looking up the gallbladder meridian. And it's interesting because it's right in the area that we're always working on with his neck and where there's pain. And, you know, I just find it interesting. And I, I did not study Chinese medicine, but I really respect it. and I. Um, and I worked for a, a doctor of oriental medicine and, you know, I'm just always trying to understand more and more. The body has this wisdom and, um, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg and, and that sort of thing. So um, I do have another patient and we're, we're getting close to running out of time. Um, I want to make sure we have time for questions. But um, a patient with rheumatoid arthritis, so diagnosed at age 28, you know, bilateral joint pain in the hips. Um, She's working with her endocrinologist, of course. Uh, there's a, a family history. When I asked her about it though, she said it was triggered. She believed it was triggered after she had multiple miscarriages and you know, got really emotional when she was talking about it. So they first tried celecoxib, then prednisone. Um, when they put her on Humira or um, Adalimumab, the um, injection form, she had horrible side effects. Um, lots of GI inflammation, um, pneumonia, recurrent strep, um, tons of antibiotics. And, you know, it's hard when you're on immunosuppressants and you have a young child. So she does have a three-year-old son and, you know, <laughs> she's in nursing school and, and she works at a clinic. And so there's, it was really, really hard for her um, to be able, you know, to not have to deal with these infections that were happening. So, um, of course, we worked with diet and then working on systemic inflammation, um, once again, high dose turmeric and boswellia, and then ashwagandha to really support the nervous system and to help with the joint pain too. Um, to help with the GI inflammation that happened after the Humira, we did a cold infusion of marshmallow root and then um, the tribulus or gokshara powder in the aloe gel. She's definitely um, a pitta constitution. And so, uh, in one month, the GI inflammation was really diminished. And actually within one week of starting the herb, she noticed a difference. Um, blood tests, there was a slight decrease in the ESR, but the antibodies were about the same. Um, she's doing a lot of other things. She's really proactive in her health. Um, so acupuncture, neuroacupuncture, uh, promoting parasympathetic. She did um, alternative allergy therapy, low-dose um, immunotherapy, and would like to try LDN, but um, I can't prescribe yet in New Mexico. We're waiting on our um, licenses to be available. She's also doing fish oil. And then six months, there was actually a decrease in her antibodies and sed rate. Um, mostly we talk about what she notices. And so she noticed that incorporating fish helped to reduce the flare ups, where, whereas sugar and alcohol consumed um, would cause inflammation within 12 hours. And then she said she can meditate her way out of pain and she does gentle yoga and stretching, um, but she's doing a lot better and she just had a follow-up. So I, I said more blood tests this week. So I spoke with her yesterday. So on the Monday webinar, I hadn't, hadn't got a follow-up yet. Her rheumatologist is really surprised. She said she's never seen um, this happen so quickly with patients um, and she's wondering if she's moving towards going into remission but she only has two joints that are slightly swollen um, in her wrist and fingers. And um, we'll see what the blood tests say, but she's currently not on any sort of immunosuppressants or steroids or anything like that. So um, really exciting to think about. These are the resources. And do you have any questions about 
the herbs we've talked about, um, case studies. You can use the text box to ask any questions. Um, we do have some, have a, a comment here. Let's see. I've had good luck using emo oil to support bioavailability. It seems to bind very well. I think that was in relation to the turmeric, um, but I'll have to, to get a confirmation on that. Um, if you come up with any questions after the webinar, feel free to also just email me. Does anyone have any um, stories they wanna share or different things they're doing with patients? Um, that we could all kind of talk about or at least um, you know bring up during this uh, closing the closing moments. And I have a comment. I found this works great in bath salts. And uh, maybe Tracy, you can let me know what you were referring to. I'm sorry, I was cruising through the slides and I'm and I didn't see um, some of the comments while we were going through the slides. But I'm curious because um, I do love uh, recommending Epsom salt baths and different things for patients um, to just increase their self care. Um, so we'll see if we can get a, a answer on that one. And let me just put this up here so you guys can make sure that you have my email address and if there's any questions or comments or feedback. And um, we're gonna continue doing monthly webinars to offer CE credits. It's something I'm really excited about doing is kind of melding the different worlds together, whether that's you know Ayurvedic and naturopathic medicine, um, but being able to kind of connect healthcare practitioners, chiropractors, um, doctors of oriental medicine, massage therapists, anybody that is interested in kind of collaborating and talking. Um, I also want to feature other healthcare practitioners that are doing Ayurveda or, or having uh, success with certain approaches to, to be on the webinar. So if you have any interest in doing that, please email me um, and we can kind of figure out uh, what topic might be fun to do. But the goal is to allow for practitioners to get continuing education credits by joining these webinars. And so just once again, really gracious and really thankful for Rebel Herbs to be sponsoring and offering that gift to us. Um, so let's see here. Oh, okay, yes, Gokshura. I have a question of a patient who was diagnosed with RA by rheumatologist, elevated CRP, ESR, pain, swelling, and index finger is not changed at all. Um, she's on anti-inflammatory diet, Mariva, and doing acupuncture with no change in pain. She's definitely a pitta kapha. Any ideas? Definitely stumped. So um, remind me, Anna, is... I think Mariva is just curcumin, is that correct? I would definitely think about incorporating um, some Boswellia as well. And um, what I've found with my RA patient and what really kind of stumped us is once she started utilizing um, the reprogramming of her allergic responses with the low dose immunotherapy, um, alternative allergy therapy, that sort of addressing that kind of reprogramming of her immune system and how it was responding um, along with the herbs that we were doing, she definitely showed improvement. So if you can find anyone um, that does that and, and email me specifically so I can connect you to the the therapies that, um, the specific therapies that we found helpful for her. Um, and let's see here. She does ginger shots in the morning and wondering if it's too heating for her. Um, it could be a little bit too heating. Um, this time of year, it might not be as bad. I would definitely not have the combination of the heating herbs in the summertime, but maybe what you could do is 
have turmeric there as a as a buffer so do turmeric and ginger and together and see if that is more helpful or the boswellia incorporating that in because it's going to be more of that sort of um balancing to the ginger um Okay, she's not on any pharmaceuticals. Okay, yes, it's just, so Mariva is just curcumin. So um, I would love to talk about the case even further. Um, Anna, if you want to email me, then I can let you know um, more specifics about the, like I said, the immunotherapy that she did, as well as um, we can talk about different ways of incorporating the herbs. Um, but I would definitely think about adding in Boswellia and then maybe something to counterbalance the ginger or looking at, you know, is she having any other increase in pitta in her body, um, any skin stuff coming up where there's just too much heat and that can kind of help us realize like, okay, let's back off or let's add something or, you know, during the winter time it's good, but let's maybe back off in the summertime with the ginger. Um, but it's great that she's not on any, you know, pharmaceuticals because this is a great time to incorporate as much as you can. Um, you know, in the alternative medicine realm. And so, um, if you have any other questions, feel free to uh, reach out to me directly. I know it's 11 o'clock, so I wanna be really, really respectful of your time, or it's been an hour, wherever you are in the world, it's a different time, but um, it's been an hour. So I wanna thank you once again for, for being here today, and I look forward to collaborating, and I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your week and beginning of the first month of 2020. Thank you so much, and we will see you soon.